everybody, thank you. Thank you for joining us. This has been Kenny. I'm joined with my always partner in crime, Bob Stewart. Bob Stewart and I uh, created the Win Make Give podcast. And along with our, our partner in crime, uh, Chad Himes, we also made the, the Well Series. So I hope so many of you have taken the Well Series or at least listened to us on the podcast. But today's uh, not about Bob Stewart or Ben Kinney. Uh, today's actually not even about my friend Tom Wheelwright. It's, it's about you. And uh, many, many years ago, uh, Bob and Tom, uh, I realized that money was something that was happening to me. <laughs> like money was something that I, that I made me sick to my stomach when I swiped my my debit card. I'm like, I, man, I really <laughs> I really hope that this goes through. Like money was something that I dreaded when my my mortgage payment was due. Uh, and it w- wasn't more than 12 years ago that um, I was missing mortgage payments or my water was turned off or my power. So if any of you can relate to at some point in your life, money being something that happened to you and something that stressed you out, just go into the chat box and just tell me. Uh, if not, then maybe you were, you were raised in a different family or you married super good or, or you've just been really, really lucky. I don't, I don't know, but I decided 10 years ago that no longer was money going to happen to me. Money was going to become a tool that created freedom for me in the future. And that started with me becoming a, a student of money. I read, uh, I want to say a hundred books, but maybe it was 50 or 60 different books about money. Some of my favorites, the simple path, to wealth profit first, uh, Robert Kiyosaki's rich dad, poor dad, cash flow quadrants, uh, the psychology of money. It just, I, the a millionaire real estate investor. There were so many good books that that helped me come up with my my own plan about wealth building. Well, in reading Robert Kiyosaki's uh, books for the third, fourth, or fifth time, uh, I ran across the book that was part of the Rich Dad Poor Dad Advisors Group, and that book became honestly the the most life-changing financial book that I've ever read. And, and I don't want to give you, uh, inflate your modest ahead, Tom, but um, Tax-Free Wealth was arguably the most life-changing book of my, of my life. And it doesn't matter what income level you're at. If you're making 50,000 or 100,000 or 500,000 or a million or 10 million or whatever that might be, for most of those individuals, their number one expense is what, Tom? Taxes. Taxes. And when I sat down early in my career and made a list of, of let's say I'm, I made $100,000. If, if I made a list of the $100,000 that I made, 30000 of it came off the top that went to the federal government for taxes. And then another percent went to property taxes and, and sales taxes and state taxes and just all these bizarre ways that the government takes 30 to 50 percent of of our income away and i thought i, I gotta do something about that so I, I i started finding tax books and that's that's how i found my um now friend tom now I, when i find somebody smarter than me i just force my way into their lives and i make them my friends so tom <laughs> i made you i forced you to be my friend and uh, ladies and gentlemen um i'm super excited to introduce our co-host today, uh, Tom Wheelwright, the first author of of Tax-Free Wealth, and now the author of a brand new book called The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, The Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. And before we jump into any of these, Tom, why don't you give everybody who's listening um, just a brief bio of, of why we should be listening to you real quick. No, I, I appreciate that. And I, uh, it's a great honor to be called your friend. So thank you very much for that. Um, that best introduction of any of any. Uh, so I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, good Mormon boy. Um, yeah. So I spent two years as a Mormon missionary in uh, France, where I learned how to get rejected in French. Um, the great way to start a, 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 a lifetime of entrepreneurship. Uh, then I spent a couple of years at the University of Utah to do my undergraduate in accounting and a couple of years at the University of Texas for my graduate degree in accounting and tax. I spent seven years with Ernst & Young, including three years in their national tax department in Washington, D.C., four years as the in-house tax advisor for a Fortune 1000 company. 
Uh, 14 years as an adjunct professor in the Masters of Tax program at Arizona State University, 25 years buying, building, selling CPA firms, um, 15 years traveling the world with Robert Kiyosaki, uh, teaching on six continents and 30 plus countries, um, and learning the tax laws of 30 plus countries. And uh, the last four or five years uh, developing a network, actually, uh, you're uh, certainly one of my heroes in this uh, area, Ben, as to developing a network. We're developing a network of CPA firms um, because we think there's a better way to serve our clients. We think there's a better way to serve our CPAs. And so that's really what we're doing now. My, my, my job is to make taxes fun and easy and understandable. So that is my, that is my goal in life. That's, that's my purpose of, uh, to be is to make it fun, easy and understandable. And, um, so tax free wealth was really about, um, teaching people that the tax law is a guide to reducing your taxes and win-win wealth is a, uh, to teach people that the tax law is a guide to making money and building wealth. So uh, they're companion books. They they go with each other. So uh, really appreciate being with everybody here. I got to tell you, um, being with a Ben Kinney audience is one of the great pleasures of my life. Yeah, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun group of people. I, I, I just love our, our audience. They're such great, great human beings. Uh, Tom, you've had a pretty amazing career. And uh, for the last three or four years, you've been my personal tax coach and you've, you've helped me tremendously in all areas of my life. And uh, I really appreciate that. Let's talk about the tax code. Now, I came from a world where my dad literally said uh, rich people are bad. And if you read the news, people that paid less taxes are evil individuals. And I, I believe that to be entirely untrue. You, you've taught me that in the tax code, how many pages are there on how to pay taxes? Uh, two. Two. So there's two pages in the tax code. And the tax code is this. It's taller than me. And I'm not very tall. But I mean, it's taller than me. There's two pages on how to pay taxes. And the rest of the tax code is about what? How to reduce taxes. How not to pay taxes. Yep. But everybody sees the tax code not as that. And if, if I think about what the actual tax code is, the tax code is a way for the government to incentivize normal people like all of us on where to put our money. And when we put our money in those places, it makes a positive impact in creating jobs, improving the environment, building businesses improving communities and, and real estate and in schools, right? Improving charities. What would you add to that sentence or statement? Well, I would add that, you know, most people think uh, taxes are a zero sum game. They think that there's a, there's a winner, either the government wins and I lose, or I win by cheating and the government loses. And uh, when you actually understand how the tax law works, which I spent 40 years um, uh, loving taxes and, and just uh, studying them it, inside and out um, in every country. Uh, what you find is that that's not really the whole point of uh, taxes at all. Um, taxes can be a win-win. In other words, the government can win and you can win. Uh, the, the, really, it's the choice is yours. The choice is, um, <laughs> what I like to say is, you know what, the government's your partner. Anybody who's ever gotten a paycheck and seen FICA and withholding and wonder who those guys were, um, know that uh, the government's your partner and you, they're, they're your partner whether you like it or not. And you can either be a good partner or a bad partner with the government and they can be a good partner or a bad partner, but it's really up to us. You know, they, the, the law's out there. It's available to everybody. I mean, there's, you know, there's, it's not a secret, right? It's just that people are, have this, such fear. And just like your dad, they've been told that, you know, if you don't pay taxes, you're bad. Well, if you cheat on your taxes, I would agree with that. You are bad. Um, but starting in the 1960s, John F. Kennedy, uh, what politicians realized was that, boy, the government could leverage really well. When we talk about real estate, we leverage in real estate. Um, but the government could leverage a lot if instead of building housing themselves, they actually encouraged real estate people, developers to build housing. If instead of hiring people directly, they encourage businesses to hire people. And that's really where the modern tax law came. came. And, uh, you know, and, and again, we looked at 15 countries 
in the win-win wealth strategy. We didn't just look at the U.S. and said, look, this is not just a U.S. phenomenon. This is something that is done the same all over the world. Yeah. This call is, is not a call for rich people or poor people or anybody. It's a call for all of us. And to put it into perspective, if you, if you learn one thing today from Tom and that one thing saves you $1,000 a year in taxes, and you were to take that $1,000 and instead of going to Nordstrom's or Cabela's or wherever you, you spend that money, you take that $1,000 and you just simply invested it, it would be a life-changing amount of money. I'm going to do the exact math. Bob, what's $1,000 divided by 12? Uh, $85 oh, yeah. maybe. 867 uh, yeah. In In 30 years, uh, you'd have an extra $240,000. And that would be a life-changing amount of money for a lot of people in their retirement. If you save $10,000 a year, uh, and you were able to invest that in 30 years, it'd be $2.4 million. So what I'm trying to convince you all today is that instead of giving your money to the government to find one useful tip from this conversation, that where you could create some excess income that you could invest in something that'll compound over time. That's it. That's the goal of today's call. Anything you guys want to add to that, Bob or Tom? Uh, yeah, you know what? It, 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 I I run similar numbers. I, I like you. I like to run the numbers, and um, the difference, by the way, on those numbers between paying tax and not paying tax is uh, unbelievable. It's three to four times as much money if you don't pay tax on the earnings than if you do pay tax on the earnings. And so, you know, like if you took ten thousand dollars and invested it over 30 years at 10% interest, but you paid 40% of those earnings in tax, uh, you'd have about $60,000 at the end of 30 years. But if you didn't pay any tax on the earnings of that $10,000, you'd have almost 200,000. So it is a huge, huge difference as you suggest. And um, what's great is you can do that in, you know, I love the name of the podcast, Win, Make, Give, because you can win and the government wins. You can make a lot of money. You can build a lot of wealth. But here's the thing. All of the, um, at least five of the seven investments that the government pays you to make are things that you are doing things for other people. This is a way to actually invest in other people. In other words, if you know, we all know that if we buy our own house, we get a small tax deduction. But if you buy houses for other people, you get a much bigger tax deduction. So if you buy rental properties and you, you buy properties, you rent them out, you get a lot bigger tax deduction than if you buy one for yourself. If you create jobs for other people, you get a lot more tax benefits. If you create um, energy, you drill for oil or you build solar farms or whatever, you do a lot more for other people, you get a lot more tax benefits. So really one of the messages is the more you do for others, the more money you make and the less tax you pay. Let's, let's dive in to the seven categories uh, of the seven primary investments that, that we can make. You want to just run through what the seven are real quick for me, Tom? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Um, business is number okay. one. And it's, uh, you'll notice that uh, there's more written on business than anything else because more incentives around the world and in the U.S. are, uh, are for being a business owner than anything else, yeah. anything by far. Every, uh, and everybody, every country, uh, all 15 of those countries give tax benefits to businesses. Uh, number two um, would be, uh, that goes along with business would be technology. So um, as you know, <laughs> building technology like you do, uh, technology has tremendous tax benefits. It's why, it's why Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos didn't pay tax for so many years. Um, and then the next one would be real estate and then uh, energy. Then we have agriculture, we have, and then we have two that are a little on the selfish side, frankly, but they're security. The government wants us to create security. Uh, one of those is insurance, has tremendous tax benefits, one that people don't typically think about as an incentive of the government. And the last one is the one that everybody knows about, 
um, but probably the least important of the seven is re, uh, from the government standpoint and from the taxpayer standpoint is retirement planning. And retirement plans is actually the only one. This is the, interesting to me, um, Ben, is that everybody accepts that retirement plans are an okay thing, right? No, Nobody's complaining about, oh, the, you, you, we shouldn't be able to deduct our 401k. We shouldn't be able to deduct our IRA or pension plan. Nobody's complaining about that. That is the only one of the seven where the government doesn't make money. <laughs> they break even. And I find that, fa I just found that fascinating. I mean, they do work for the taxpayer. They actually really don't work for the government. So um, the, it's, it's just the one area where the government doesn't make money. The other six, they do. And uh, it's it's all good. But just know that it's, it is number seven on purpose and business is number one on purpose. Okay, great. I love that. So let me set the stage for you, Tom, about who's on the call today. Uh, there's employees of medium, small, and large companies. Uh, I imagine there's a lot of real estate professionals that are independent contractors on here. Uh, there's people that own other businesses, small and big, right? And, you know, potentially even there's some retired people or some people that um, are doing things on the side. But let's put it in the category that the vast majority of people are uh, employed or they are uh, independent contractors in, in, in some format. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. Let's start with the first category, business. One of my beliefs and one of the things that Bob and I have preached in the well series, which you were a part of, was that everybody should own a business. Uh, whether you have a full-time job, and, and you work at a company, you should probably also have a business doing something, selling widgets, MLM, get your real estate license, something. Start us off with kind of talking about why should everybody have a business? Yeah, I find it fascinating. Everybody's talking about inflation right now. Everybody's talking about inflation, but nobody's talking about what's the easiest, fastest, quickest way um, to make additional income. Right. They're always talking about budgeting. You know, why, why would I, I mean, why do I want to budget? I don't want to spend, I, I don't want to save money. I don't want to spend less money. What I want to do is make more money. And the easiest way to do that is business. Here's what, uh, one of the things that was fun in writing this book is that I ran a lot of numbers in a lot of different scenarios when I was writing the book. And one, one of them that I did early on in uh, the, that first chapter on business is what are the tax consequences of starting a business? And just how much of that cost of starting a business out of your home, you know, you're talking about a side hustle, right? Does the government pay for? And I was shocked, honestly, I, I was not prepared for this. Um, given that you have a lot of expenses that you already have these expenses, you're just not deducting these expenses. There are things like uh, your, your home, like uh, maintenance of your home, like your internet, like your utilities, like your car. These are expenses you have anyway. You're going to have them no matter whether you have a business or not. Um, and as we learned over the last few years, if you don't have a business uh, and you work from home, you don't get any deductions. But if you do have a business work from home, you do get it. You do get deductions. Running the numbers, the tax savings for, for starting a business is greater than the cost of starting the business. Literally, the government will pay more than 100% of the cost of starting a business. So we're talking about a small business, right? We're talking about it. We're not talking about, you know, a, a, a huge business, but literally the government will pay for more than the cost of starting a small business. So why would you not start a small business that the government's going to pay for? So basically you have zero risk starting that business. You get tremendous tax benefits, um, not just today, but in the future. And you got a, an additional source of income that you can grow exponentially. Uh, there's no limit on business. There's limits on other investments. There's limits on how much you're going to make in the stock market. There are no limits on how much money you're going to make in business. So I am a huge fan. I think entrepreneurs are the lifeblood of the world. And so that's actually one of the reasons I do what I do. And I, I think the governments around the world clearly believe the same thing because the tax incentives are so amazing. What do you think some of the biggest, two questions, what do you think some of the biggest tax strategies are for businesses? And what do you think are some of the most common missed things that people don't know about or they don't take advantage of regardless of what size their business is? 
Uh, so, so really the, the, the biggest things for um, uh, business is when, remember that every dollar you earn in your business that you invest back in your business is not taxable. So you literally can fund your business tax-free. There aren't a lot of things you can do that with. But business, you can fund your business tax-free. That's how strong, uh, you know, you're, you're putting that money in the business. Well, it's growing in value. You're making more money. But every dollar you put back into the business is um, tax-free. So why not build an asset, pay no tax, and have something that down the road, you know, we, we're all going to exit. Um, but literally, we can exit tax-free. Okay, because you can exit a business tax free. Not very many things you can exit tax free. Uh, actually, business and real estate, the only two things <laughs> that you can exit tax free. Okay, so, uh, you know, when you consider that, uh, I mean, I, I just think that's such a huge incentive. And then, of course, business is the foundation of all the other tax benefits. So if you look at the other strategies, especially the other four that are, um, some type of a, they're all some type of business. Real estate is a type of a business. Energy is a type of a business or can be used in your business. Um, technology is part of your business. Agriculture is a business. And so all of those, they have extra benefits, but they all start with being a business. And I, I just, I, I, I believe that that business and, and the other thing you're doing is think about how much you're giving people. Cause the only reason you start a business is because you're solving a problem. That's the only, there's, that's the only reason you would ever be successful because you're starting a bit, you're, you're solving somebody else's problem. Well, how great is that, that you're able to solve somebody else's problem, make money and pay no tax. I, I just think that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. One of the things that you taught me is you said, Hey Ben, if you, you own a business and you have a home office, yeah. it changes what I can do with my car. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so you talk about the biggest things we miss, right? I think the number one is home office because um, 30 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, 25 years ago, um, a home office was a red flag on your tax return, 25 years ago. And, and that just got, kind of got built into you know, the, the dynamic and how CPAs and, and, you know, CPAs pass it on to their junior CPAs and junior CPAs pass it when they became senior CPAs pass on to their junior CPAs. And now we, we have this, um, this idea that somehow this is this red flag to the IRS. What actually is the red flag to the IRS and everybody who's a independent contractor should particularly be paying attention to this. What's a red flag to the IRS is having a schedule C on your tax return. That's a red flag, okay? And if you have a Schedule C, by the way, your home office will be a red flag. But if you don't have a Schedule C, for example, you're an S corporation, a C corporation, a, 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 a limited partnership. If you do it some other way, uh, A, there's no red flag because all the IRS sees is that you've got an office expense. They don't. There is no form for home office in that type of a tax return, only on your personal tax return. And second of all, um, you're, you, you've got an opportunity to um, take deductions, like you said, on a lot of things that you wouldn't otherwise take a deduction. Um, remember, any, anything that you're spending now that you could take a deduction on, that's a permanent tax savings because you're never going to have to repay that tax to the government, unlike an IRA or a 401k where you actually have to pay the money back when you take the money out. In this case, this is a permanent tax savings. Um, and so let's talk about the car real quick. Um, so here's the rule. The rule is in the US that the first travel you do during the day is a commute. And the last travel you do at night is also a commute. So it doesn't matter if you're going to a client, doesn't matter if you're going to your office, it doesn't matter if you're going to, to the hardware store, it doesn't matter. That's a commute, the very first um, journey of the day. Now, what happens when you have home office? Well, your first commute's 30 feet. It's 30 feet from your kitchen to your home office. And your last commute of day is from your home office because you're going to stop at your home office, do your administrative work at the end of the day. It's a very efficient way to do it. And then you're going to go back to your kitchen, right? That's typically how we start and end the day. My, my wife says you start at the end, 
You start the day with coffee and you end it with wine. Those are the bookends to the day, right? So the home office is the business bookends to the day. Well, what that means is, is that, yeah, that 30 foot walk is a commute. It is that 30 foot walk is a commute. It is, <laughs> it's not deductible, the 30 foot walk. But that very first trip outside of your home office is now deductible. So for most people, that will um, as much as double the amount of deduction they get for their automobile. It, it's a it's a huge number. I when I hear people say, "Well, my accountant said don't take the home office deduction; it's a red flag, and it's not that much money." I'm going, so you're not paying attention to the idea that wait a minute, I also get to deduct my car, other things I get to deduct that I wouldn't otherwise get. It makes the vast majority of the mileage that you use in your vehicle and the vast majority of your vehicle's usage actually tax deductible simply by one, owning the business, and two, having a home office that you write off. What are you thinking, Bob? You have that look on your face. Like uh, you're, I just, you're there's something? so many people in here that are like, uh, my account said not to do that. Or do you know an accountant in the Skagit area? Like, Tom, you've talked about having a network of agents, like CPAs around the country. Can Is there a place I can send these people right now? The ones that are like, hey, where do I get an account? Send, send, them, send them to wealthability.com okay. for that. That's, that's uh, wealthability.com, schedule a call. By the way, if you have an accountant that you like and you say, I think they could learn this, Send them to us too. We'll and we'll we'll just bring them into the network. So we're we're happy to help any any way we can there. Um, I saw I saw a note. What you know? If I have multiple home office uh, businesses, can I have multiple home offices? You don't even need multiple businesses. Um, I will tell you in my house. Okay, um, I'm right now in my studio, which is a separate building next to my house, and that is entirely business. I have a home office that I use. My wife has her own CPA firm and she has her office and she has an office for employees because her employees work out of the house. So you can imagine what percentage of our house is business use. And it's an enormous percentage. There are other things you can use. You might use your house for business meetings. You, you might use a segment. Now, remember, a home office has to be exclusive. So you can't, if you use it part time, it doesn't count. But if you use it full time, and it, by the way, it can even be a corner. So it doesn't even have to be an entire room. You could literally put the back corner of your uh, family room and say, okay, kids, hands off. This is, this, this, is, this is mommy's or this is daddy's home office. And we're not gonna do anything here. And it's just like, you know, uh, 50 square feet. You can do that. And that is legitimate. One other thing that people forget and that they get told all the time, if I have an office outside the home, I can't have an office inside the home. That is no longer true. That changed also many years ago. Um, you can, you have to use your home office differently than you use your business office. I mean, for example, I have um, several businesses, but I have a CPA firm and it has an office. Okay. I don't, uh, now I go to that office every once in a while and I meet with, I, I might meet with the client or I might meet with the staff. Um, but most of my time I'm in my home office. So my home office is my primary office. And that's that's the key is you want your home office to be your primary office. We have a lot of uh, breeders, as I like to call them, on the call right now. They, <laughs> they've bred a lot. They uh, make lots of little children. If you own your own business, can we get some use out of these little rug rats? Like, can we hire our kids? Oh, my heavens. Yes. I, I'll tell you a quick story about that, Ben. So I was in South Africa a number of years ago with Robert. And we, uh, I, I like to find a, a local accountant, um, tax advisor, so that, you know, we have local credibility. And I brought uh, Candace up on stage. Candace has become a good friend of mine. She's a, a terrific accountant in South Africa. And uh, I'm talking, I'm saying, you know, you could hire your kids in your business. You get a deduction and your kids are either in a lower bracket or for the first $12,000 in the US, you're in a zero bracket. And, and I turned to her and I said, could you do that in, the, in, in South Africa? And she looked at me and she goes, the light bulb just, she goes, well, yeah. And I'm going, she's like, the minute she's off stage, she's on the phone with all of her clients saying, hey, you need to do this, right? And she's a smart, she's a very smart tax advisor. And yet it's not something we typically think of. I grew up in a family business. Um, 
you know, I, I'm the youngest of six kids. My dad was a printer. His, uh, he and his dad uh, had uh, started this printing company together. And we all worked at the printing company in some form or fashion. I happened to work in the bookkeeping department. Shocking. And um, my mother was the controller. And so, uh, you know, I look at a family business and I'm going, well, duh. Yeah, I mean, of course you can do that. But I grew up with that. And I, my kids both work in my company. Now they're grown and they, they work in my company. I love the idea. Think about this. Think about why would the government say it's, it's a good thing to have your kids work in your business? First of all, um, is it a good idea to teach kids how to work? I think everybody would say yes. I think we should yeah. do more of that. That makes sense. Would, would, it, would it be nice to have, be able to actually pass on the skill sets and even the business onto the kids and continue the, the business and, and grow the business? Well, yeah. Okay. Is, what, does it help keep the kids out, off the street and out of trouble? Yeah. I mean, is it, is it, does, could it help fund the kids' um, uh, college education? Yeah. I'm going, so you look at all these things, you go, well, of course the government would be in favor of this. It's so much in favor of it that if you set it up right, you don't even have to pay social, the kids don't even have to pay social security tax on that money. Okay, so you could actually set it up so the kids don't pay social security tax. Well, why in the world would the government say, well, kids don't have to pay social security tax, but everybody else in the world does? Well, it's simply because they're saying we want to incentivize kids working for their family business. How how young could they be for us to hire them? (laughs) Well, it depends on what they do, right? I mean, the, the, the rule is you have to pay them what you would pay somebody else. Um, now, I have, uh, uh, you know, dentists who um, are uh, uh, pediatric den- dentists. So they take pictures of their kids and they use it in advertising. Well, they can be a model as a, as a uh, you know, as a baby just getting their teeth, first teeth. I was an like, ugly baby, so I don't think I would make that cut, but uh, Bob was probably a very attractive baby. He, he probably was. My, I, I will say my, my oldest brother, who is um, uh, probably the, the smartest and, and best well-known uh, in my family, um, he was a really ugly baby. So we would never have put him. I mean, Sarah is a like super ugly. You look at this kid, you go, why'd you bring him home? Um, <laughs> unfortunately, he grew out of it, but boy, was he an ugly baby. Uh, <laughs> so so the, the gist of it is, we could pay our kids. Is there a yeah. maximum amount per year we can pay them without having a penalty to them or to us? You know, it, you, you can pay them as much as you would pay somebody else. So um, the first twelve thousand dollars non taxable to them. So After we that, our they, kid twelve thousand dollars. They would. It's non taxable income tax, and they're not paying any income tax. But or we take if, that as an expense in our business. Of the it's, exactly. But here's the thing: you can pay them another. $9,000 and they only pay 10%. So if you're in a 40% bracket and they're in a 10% bracket, that's still a good deal. Then there's another level at 12%. So, you know, we, I, I, can't, I hear people say, well, you can pay them up to $12,000. No, I literally, you could pay them $30,000 and the tax benefits would be substantial. Okay. Bob, so then Bob, who takes his kids to Disneyland 74 times a year, when they go up to Disneyland, He's going to use that money, their debit card, and they're going to say, all right, kids, you're paying for your own things. You want to right. stuff animal, yeah. they're going to pay for that. Right. So so we're required as parents to pay for our kids um, food and shelter, clothing. We're not required to pay for Disneyland. We're not required to pay for the college education. We're not required to pay for their vacations. Um, and that can come out of their custodial account. The other thing we can do with that money, remember, is it can go into a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. It can go into your, you can in, invest in your real estate with, they can invest in, with you in their, in your real estate. You can invest, um, you could do, teach them how to do stock trade. I mean, there's so many things when they have their own funds and think about, um, you know, when it comes for time for college or their first house, you're not going to be paying for that. They are. Yeah. I love that. So there's all these different strategies that I've learned in both of your books uh, that are applicable to all of us. In the first one, you're saying, if you own a business, your business can pay your kids. If you own a business, you can have a home office. If you own a business, you can write off your car, your internet, your amazing clothing, like uh, 
Bob and I were, were definitely swagged out. So we could write off that. I, I love it. Uh, the second chapter is technology and research and development. This is probably not applicable to an enormous amount of the people, but maybe it is. Give me like a, let's do like a 30 second or minute on this. And then let's go to the next one, which is real estate. Uh, I think a lot, a lot more people um, qualify for the technology than think they do. Okay. There are a lot of times where we're creating a new system where uh, we may not be writing new software, but we may be uh, creating a new way of doing something. And a lot of times those qualify for the research and development tax credit. And so there are, I, I think we create more technology in our business than we think we do because we're thinking, we think very narrowly when it comes to our thought of technology, but technology is a much broader um, we, we can take a much broader, broader view of it for tax purposes, as long as there's some experimentation involved and a trial and error and testing, then probably we're going to qualify. Okay. That makes sense. So it, it doesn't have to be software development. We don't got to be making robots or rockets to go to the moon. Exactly. We are making improvements and we own a business. And we own a business. Potentially there are some ability to get some research and development credits, uh, which are just additional tax benefits to, to us. Awesome. I bet you there's some people on this call that are in real estate. Anybody on this call going to the chat? Are you in real estate? Just hit yes, if you are. Uh, just a few hundred. <laughs> so I have a I have a business partner. We do this mastermind event. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about taxes and wealth building. And uh, his name is Brian Gubernick. And Brian, he, he pays his kids to come in and talk at our events. They teach something every time, right? He, he gives them money. They use that to fund retirement and pay for their dance lessons and everything else. But one of the things that Brian and I talk about all the time is the tax benefits of owning and investing in real estate. Because I think it's probably, I don't like using the word loophole because it's not really a loophole. It's the greatest tax incentive that's available to, you know, in my mind, to, to my audience, right? Because we all buy real estate and think about real estate. And, you know, I try to convince all my employees and friends to stop selling their houses and keep it and then, and then buy another one, but they always sell it. So they never get any tax benefits. And it makes me angry. I'm not saying names, but you know who you are. <laughs> Tell me about the tax benefits of real estate. So, so uh, I would use the term tax shelter because it really is. It's a legitimate tax shelter. Uh, there, I, I listed eight in the book, but I'm going to go through three. Um, the first one is what we call depreciation, which is um, meaning the wear and tear on the building, the contents of the building, and the improvements to the land, like landscaping and outdoor lighting, stuff like that. Um, this year, so we have a window of opportunity this year. This year in the U.S., uh, we get to write off entirely the day we put that property into service, we get to write off the contents of the building completely. We don't have to take five, seven years, whatever. We get to write off completely the land improvements. We don't have to wait 15 years like we normally do. We can write it off entirely, which means that on, on average, average purchase price, uh, if you think about the purchase price, you're going to get 20 to 30% of that purchase price is a deduction in year one. Okay, so then let's add the second biggest benefit of real estate, and that is debt. Debt is the second largest benefit to real estate. And you go, well, why would the government incentivize debt? Well, remember, every time that a bank loans money for a mortgage, they're creating money, and the government needs money created. Okay, the, the government doesn't want to print it all the time. They want it to cre be created in the marketplace. And so they incentivize debt. And here's just how big this is. Let's say you had $100,000 to invest. You could go out and buy a $100,000 house and you get a $20,000 deduction on that first year bonus depreciation. Okay, assuming you do a cost segregation, you hire the right professionals and everything. Let's say instead though, you take that $100,000, you borrow $400,000 from the bank and you buy $500,000 of investment real estate. Now, instead of a $20,000 deduction, you're gonna get a $100,000 deduction, which essentially means that you made $100,000 in your job, you put it into real estate and didn't pay tax on that $100,000 that you made in your job. 100% so, tax-free. 
completely tax free. It's absolutely unbelievable. Just what a great tax benefit is. You go, well, why is that? Well, you know, this came about, this big tax benefit came about in 2017. And I, I can't remember the name of that president, but seems to me he was a real estate developer. So not too shocking that we have real estate as a massive uh, tax opportunity. Um, the third one is that you never have to pay tax when you sell the real estate. So like I said, with business, business is one you can set it up so you never pay tax. Um, real, uh, real estate is another one where you can set yourself up. We call it buy, borrow, die that I go through it in tax-free wealth. Um, and you can actually, you buy the property, you borrow against the property anytime you need money. And then, uh, you die. And when you die, all your taxes go away. They like, it's like magic. They disappear. Kind of, well, kind of like you, but, uh, seriously, they, they, they die with you, your tax bill dies with you for most people. Okay. Unless you're over $12 million as a single person, $24 million married, um, your taxes die with you. So uh, the, the, those are the top three. I mean, I go through five more in the book, but those are the top three. And they are magnet. Like you said, they are magnificent tax benefits. Um, it does start that depreciation does start to phase out by the way, in 2023, it goes down to 80%, 2024, um, 60%. And then 2025, it gets down to 50% and stays there. So we do have uh, this year, we have a particular window of opportunity. And, um, you know, I mean, and, and the other thing to consider is, let, let's say you're a real estate agent, and somebody's selling their house, right? Well, if they sell that house, and they take and, and they're going to pay tax because they've got this huge gain, right? They're over that 250000 They take that excess gain and they put it into a rental property. Now they're not going to pay tax on that, that, that excess gain. So you can actually eliminate, still take the $250,000 out, not pay tax on that. You can use that any way you want. The, the extra money, $100,000, $200,000, whatever, put into a new piece of real estate, new, new rental property, something that's going to make you money and you won't pay tax on that capital gain. So let me summarize some of these things. Uh, one, if you buy owner-occupied real estate and you sell it and you make less than $250,000 as a single person or less than $500,000 as a married couple, you don't pay any tax on that gain. That's correct. Tax benefit one. Tax benefit two is if you buy real estate that you plan to rent out or you move out of your primary residence and then you start renting that one out, you get to do something called accelerated depreciation or cost segregation, bonus depreciation, all words for basically the same thing, where you can write up, write off up to 30% of that property's price that you paid for. Yeah. One, one little caveat there, Ben, is that if, if you're taking the property you already own and convert it to rental property, you're not going to get that bonus. You will get some accelerated depreciation, you'll, you'll get some depreciation, but you won't get the bonus depreciation. That's only for property you're buying that you didn't own before. Okay. Uh, second is we have a lot of people on this call that are in places like New York City, where it's hard to imagine that they could buy a home for a couple of million dollars, or they live in San Francisco, or they are in maybe Austin, Texas, or Seattle, and these average home prices are 500000 or a million or whatever it is. They could do this by, as Bob and Stuart and I like to teach people, buying a second home, maybe in Phoenix or Tucson or somewhere that doesn't rain like Seattle, right? And they could put 10% down because it's a uh, second home financing, put it up on Airbnb, stay in it a little bit. And that, let's say they bought a $400,000 home, they put 10% down, they put $40,000 down this year. If it was in, in service, Tom, they would get 30% roughly of the $400,000 purchase price. Yeah. So think about that. $120,000. In tax and reduced income. $120,000 deduction. So if I'm a, in a 40% tax bracket, that's worth $48,000, which is greater than your $40,000 down payment. So literally, the government has paid you to make that investment. Once again, these are seven investments the government will pay you to make. This you is pay money zero income taxes this year, and you get a property that somebody else is paying off for you. One right. of my friends said, "Hey, how did?" Somebody asked him, "How do you become a millionaire?" And he said, uh, is "David Green." He said, "Well, I'd, I'd buy a million dollars worth of real estate and let somebody else pay it off for me." Yep. 
Okay. Uh, you also talked about 1031 exchanges, which you, you always move the property you own here to a better and different property here. So you don't ever realize that, that you never pay taxes. Right. You and I have done some other things like uh, opportunity zones. Yep. And there's more advanced things that we can do in, in taxes that you'll read about in tax-free wealth and in obviously in Tom's new book, The Win-Win Wealth strategy, the seven investments the government will pay you to make. Well, let's, let's keep going to another chapter. Uh, is energy really relevant to the audience or you want to skip one? You what know what? Energy is huge for the audience. Okay. And I'm going to tell you why. Yeah. This is probably the one that's missed most often. Okay. You own a rental property. Okay. You put solar on, on that rental property. In you Seattle, get- that would work one day a year. What's that? In Seattle, that would work one yeah, day. We're not, I, I noticed we have people in, in uh, Hawaii. We have people in California. Arizona, we have people yeah. in Texas. Not everybody lives in Seattle. Okay. Okay. okay great. I, I, okay. Just for the record. Okay. okay. So it doesn't apply to everybody, but anybody who has any kind of sunshine during the year, it's going to uh, apply to you put, you put solar, let's say, let's say, or you put it on your office building. Okay. You have a, let's say you put a hundred thousand dollars. Cause I can do that math. Let's say you put a hundred thousand dollars of solar. You get a 26% tax credit, which is dollar for dollar back in your pocket. That's $26,000. And you get an $87,000 tax deduction, which if you're in a 40% tax bracket, that's another boatload of money in your pocket. Literally you're paying for about a third of it out of your pocket and the government's paying two thirds. So I actually calculated on, in the book, I actually use my personal example. I'm putting about $100,000 solar on my office building. My rate of return on investment, because the government's paying for most of it, is over 20%. That's a pretty decent return with no risk. We're always going to get 300 days of sunshine in Arizona. It, we're not in danger of getting less sunshine than that. We're always going to have hot summers. We're not in danger of not having hot summers. So we're always gonna have those utility bills. And if I can reduce my utility bill, that's the same thing as putting money in my pocket and getting return on investment. Solar panels, is there other things that would be applicable electric electric car charging stations, anything else? Absolutely. You've got you, you, uh, electric cars. I mean, okay, you're tired of paying those high gas prices. Saw somebody say they're tired of paying the high gas price. Get an electric car, $7,500 tax credit. Um, you've got uh, when tax credit. For the tax audience, credit. Tax That's credit dollar for dollar. The amount of money you pay in taxes. A Correct. tax deduction reduces the amount of income that you tell the government. Correct. Okay, great. Correct. So dollar for dollar credit, dollar for dollar. So you, you can be in a 10% tax bracket and still get the whole $7,500, okay? Just to be clear, okay? You don't have to be in the 40% tax bracket for that. Um, wind, wind, wind is actually another incentive. You, you could put, you can actually put new windows on your home and have them be energy efficient and get tax credits for that, okay? So um, there's a big push to renewable energy, but by the way, a lot of people are employees. Uh, I, I notice um, here, and employees have an opportunity in energy that is uh, probably one that they don't have the opportunity in a lot of other places, and that is with fossil fuel. If you're not opposed to drilling for oil um, and uh, you know helping us uh, have more uh, oil so our gas prices go down, then um, you actually invest in an oil an oil well, which is not that difficult to do. I've done it for 40 years. Um, you get a dollar for dollar deduction and you can do that as an employee. You don't have to meet any other requirements. It's not like you have to be a real estate professional. You don't have to do anything fancy. All you have to do is uh, invest and uh, make sure that you invest the right way with the right tax professional. But literally a dollar, you put in $10,000, you get a $10,000 deduction. So that is a huge tax benefit anybody can do even you know doctors who make a million dollars a year can do that and uh and get a full tax benefit is there a place that people go to to invest in those types of things tom it's i mean that's outside of my expertise yeah yeah. typically you'd go to your financial advisor and ask them or your cpa i'd go to your financial advisor your cpa say how how do i do this um i you know i i of course i grew up in Utah, which is uh, a big uh, natural resources um, area, and I went to school in Texas, so I, I'm I'm a actually 
done a lot of work in the oil and gas area over my career. And uh, it's it's pretty amazing when I see what people have been able to do from a tax and an investment standpoint. Uh, and now, you know, oil's $100 a, a barrel. Um, there's there's some pretty decent returns. Yeah, I, I want everybody to, to read this book so much because we're skimming a fraction of 1% of what you could do and how it's applicable to you. Tom, we don't have a ton of time left, but we do have some time to cover insurance, retirement savings, or agriculture. You want to pick the first one? Yeah. So, so agriculture is not something people, people they think about, but uh, you think about why would government incentivize agriculture? Well, of course, food production is one of the most important things we do in the country. Um, uh, you know, you, you've got a lot of rain up there in, uh, you may not be able to do solar, but you can do agriculture. Yeah. Um, things grow, uh, things grow, whether you want them to or not. Right, Ben, um, in, in Bellingham. So, uh, you, you, agriculture has the best tax benefits of any, any possible category. Okay. And that's, and, and in fact, most farmers never pay income tax ever. Um, doesn't matter how much money they make. They're not going to pay income tax. Uh, there's just too, too many tax benefits. So that just to remember that that is an opportunity. I mean, I, I use an example in the book on Christmas trees. Okay. That's something you guys can grow. Okay. So you, again, what I would do is I would look at the book and I'm going, pick the one that works for you and then make sure you read the, the one on business and real estate. So pick one of the others that also works for you and then make sure that you do at least the business side of it because that's going to be part of it. Um, in, insurance is one that I think is very, very few people ever talk about. Um, but remember, life insurance is not taxable um, and it doesn't ever have to be taxable. It can actually be a really nice, safe way to put money aside if you've got a whole life or a universal life policy. Um, it doesn't make huge returns, but it's very safe. And so a lot of people, there's a lot of um, a lot of public policy behind life insurance. And there are some huge, really nice uses for life insurance. So I would give that chapter a read. And then of course, retirement plans, pretty much everybody knows about it, but pretty, pretty rare that people understood stand the actual numbers behind it. Now, I will say one thing about retirement plans. There are two types of plans. There's a qualified plan and there's a non-qualified plan. And a qualified plan is a, what I call a government-directed and government-enforced um, plan. A lot of government rules. How much I can invest, when I can invest, what I can invest in, when I can take it out, how much tax I pay. A non-qualified plan is everything else. Real estate, business, agriculture, energy, technology. Those are all non-qualified plans. Non-qualified plans, qualified plans can be good if you want to invest in the stock market. If you want, if you're willing to do one of these other strategies, basically you can build wealth. You have, you can put as much money in as you want. You can take it out whenever you want. You can control the taxes. Uh, you can control who gets it. Uh, so much more control um, and so much less risk because you have that control. And so uh, just remember that that's one of that's one of the parts of the analysis we go through. I will, um, I, I probably should end um, with the uh, teaser chapter, which is what everybody will read first, which is the chapter on how to get the government to pay for your Ferrari. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed that one. <laughs> I thought you, I thought you Mustang. would. Mine would be a classic Mustang, but I, I, I understand the principle. There you go. You know, for, for some, it's a, it's a Mustang. Um, for some, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> we have there the you go. Motor car club here, Tom. I this like it. Guys who buy old cars that break down a lot. This is definitely us, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Keep going. I love it. That sounds like my 2006 BMW Roadster. It, yeah, it, exactly. it is at that age where it's uh, it's a great car and breaks down on a regular basis. So um, it is a great car though. I do love, I, I do love that car. Um, anyway, so uh, the, the point of that chapter is it's actually a true story, uh, a client of mine um, that uh, literally was, um, we ran the numbers, the government put the down payment, paid for as making the payments on the Ferrari. And it's not the government wants you to own classic cars or a Ferrari or t Tesla or whatever that, well, they do want you to own a Tesla, but it does, it's not that they want you to own these uh, fancy cars. It's just that the Tax benefits are so good when you do what the government wants you to do that it's it could be enough to pay for a you know whatever car you wanted or airplane or anything else. Tom, there's an enormous amount of questions in chat which I keep keep scrolling through. Uh, 
I want to do, I want to make a suggestion. You tell me if this will work. Uh, in the Win Make Give Facebook group, I will, Bob Stewart will create a thread that says, ask Tom and his team your questions. Could you and somebody from your team help us answer some of these questions for people that want to yeah. keep going? Happy uh, to. Bob, yeah. can you put the link to the Facebook group in chat? And yep. then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, buy the win men wealth strategy, the seven investments the governments will pay, pay you to make. It doesn't matter if you're an employee or you're a business owner, you're overpaying on taxes. And that's stealing from your ability to fund your retirement and pay for your kids' college and make investments and own real estate and truly change your life because the number one expense that we'll ever have is taxes. And there is a way to do good for the community and for the world and the country that you're a part of while paying less taxes and taking better care of your family, your retirement, your wealth. And that's what I love about your books. Tom is not a guy that pushes fraud or illegal things. In fact, uh, I did get audited uh, in my taxes at the like second week of COVID when Washington state shut down. And one of the reasons was uh, the amount of charitable donations that we gave was disproportionate to the amount of income that we make, which you think would be a good thing for the government, but they decided that that was a red flag. Well, Tom's company represented me for the audit and he called me one day and he said, Ben, I got a bad news for you. I said, what? He said, in one year, they found that you underpaid your taxes by $800. And I said, okay. He said, but I got good news. And I said, what's that? He said, the other year, they found that you underpaid by like 17 or 1800. So they're sending you a check for 900 bucks. So my entire audit ended with them sending me a check for an extra $900 because the strategies that I learned in Tom's books were legal and they were right. And they were the type of things that the government wants you to do. In fact, the actual auditor, you remember her, Tom? I do. She she uh, probably treated us better because she knew the good that we do in the community. Wouldn't you say so? I don't think there's any question. Um, she definitely knew who you were. She definitely had very good respect, great respect for you. And uh, remember, I mean, IRS auditors are people too. Yep. And um, so reputation is important. And uh, reputation in, uh, by the way, reputation in the accounting firm that signs your tax return is also important because um, the IRS does does look at those things. So yeah. keep that in mind as well. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, the the the, the great thing that I appreciated from you, Ben, is that uh, you weren't afraid of the IRS. You weren't afraid of the audit. And you just said, OK, Tom, you guys handle it. Uh, you take care of it. Uh, let, we'll let the professionals do it. This is where your team is so important. And this is why, you know, really investing and business, it's all a team sport. This is why we have a, a network of CPAs. This is why I teach this all over the world is because, you, you know, we have to learn from each other. Yeah, well said. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Tom, thank you for coming on and and contributing and sharing less than 1% of what I learned in this book and in this book. Everybody follow the link, pick up the book today. You will love it. Bob Stewart, thank you for joining us. Everybody else, go to the Win Make Give Facebook group and put your questions and the so post is up there, Ben. So if they jump in that group, they should see my post. It has a link to Tom's book. It's got a link if somebody wanted to get a consult. And this wasn't a sales pitch to like get a consult, but a lot of people are like, my CPA doesn't know these things. So you could jump in there and do that. It's all on a post I dropped in that, that Facebook group. Yeah, Tom, Tom didn't uh, pay us to be here. I didn't pay Tom to be here. Tom's a friend of mine. He's helped me a lot in my life. And I wanted to share him with, with all of you and share something that I truly believe in. So everybody... Go build some wealth, do some good, win, make, give, all that kind of stuff. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Tom. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. See you, brother. Bye. Thanks, Tom.